So I'd like to welcome you to Pietro's Ranieri Agency podcast number four. In this series of podcasts, I'm trying to get an insight into how coronavirus is affecting businesses globally. And today I have an expert in the agency world. Today's guest, whom I'm really excited about having a chat with, is my very first mentor and boss in PR many, many years ago, Mr. Robert DaCosta. Rob founded and ran an agency back in the day called Communicating IT, which back then was a pure old school media driven technology PR agency. For me personally, it was an incredible learning experience as I was the first employee and with the business until I left seven to eight years later. The agency became one of the leading technology PR agencies in the UK at the time, and it gave me an incredible insight and grounding into so many things that I still find useful today. So welcome, Rob. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Well, Um, strange question, really, given that we're all stuck inside. I keep sending emails that are saying, have a good weekend, and then go, oh, well, have as good a weekend as you possibly can do, stuck inside. (laughs) Yeah, well, I'm, uh, yeah, it's definitely the same. I was saying to you earlier, I've got two kids here, and... um, yeah, I do apologise in advance in case one of them does come in and demand something. <laughs> I do try and keep that to a minimum. How are you coping with the hair situation as well? It's been a month now. Since been uh, I know. I'm going to have to get the. I'm going to have to get the clippers out soon. <laughs> God knows what I'm going to look like, but uh, I think I've got a number of skills. Haircuts definitely isn't one of them, so I have no idea what will happen. But. <laughs> So Rob, you founded, ran and sold a successful PR agency. Uh, What are you up to now? Well, so a bit of potted history, I suppose. So we started in 2002. And as you said, you were our first employee. I think you're actually with us nine years. And then uh, sold the agency in 2003, did my two year prison sentence, as I like to call it, um, with the company that bought our agency, which like for a lot of people wasn't a very pleasant experience. Um, just because uh, you know, I went from being the master of uh, my destiny to being part of a, a you know, a two thousand man company actually globally. Um, left there after my two years um, and thought, what the hell am I going to do with the rest of my life? It was a really difficult time of my life. Uh, one of the things I always tell people who are thinking about it, selling their agencies is to know what you're going to do next because if you get very fixated on that sale and without thinking about succession planning for you personally, it can be challenging. You anyway um the world collided for me a bit and two very diverse parts of my life came together and say hey Rob you'd be good at coaching and when I explored what I really loved about CIT it was and the thing I'm proudest of all those years later is how many people got their start like you Pietro um and how many people have gone on to do amazing things which um and I think we had probably in total about 150 employees over the 11 years of running the agency when you think about people who came and went so anyway so it was that whole that whole helping people thing that inspired me to become a coach so I spent a couple of years doing some training and then in 2007 started the cost of coaching which is what I do today 14 years later and so I work with agencies to help them grow in a profitable sustainable and enjoyable way which of course is particularly challenging right now yeah yeah. it's funny you say that it's um so 20 years on um obviously you gave me my start uh and and like you say lots of people in your agency have gone on to do bigger and better things but you know i've had the similar experience with my agency now so one of my very first well she's probably my first account manager um, is now head of um, European PR for devices at Apple, I think. Wow. I see her quite regularly, actually. She gets the same train as me into London. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? The thing is, because we're, we're not doing brain surgery or saving lives or anything, one of the best things about running your own business is, you know, employing people and seeing them flourish and giving them that kind of opportunity in that platform to grow and then you know when they leave you it's hard but when you see years later what great things they've done then you realize that is the real value of what we do yeah it's always baffled me a bit I mean in the early days you know I used to get upset when employees left um but now I've you know I think you when you've been through it a number of times like you've been through it 150 times because everyone always leaves in the end you, you left in the end even um, you, yeah. <laughs> you just have to recognise that you're actually just, you know, you're a stepping stone to their next opportunity. Yeah, it's just a life cycle and you have to be, you know, accepting of that and not le- and learn not to take it personally. It's usually, you know, it's usually definitely not personal. It's usually because, you know, they 
feel that they can progress by going somewhere else, earning more money, changing career, whatever that is, it's just part of the journey. And if you've done all you can to um, keep your staff and give them a great experience and a great environment, you can't do any more than that. Yeah, no, well said. Well said. So, um, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted you um, on this podcast today, A, to catch up because we haven't spoken for a while. It's always <laughs> um, but, you know, you're obviously coaching now and you're coaching and specialising within the kind of agency um, sort of model and, I guess there's you sort of see one man bands through to much bigger agencies yeah. um, with the Corona situation. I mean, how has that affected your clients? I mean, what are their sort of concerns right now? I think it's, I think we're still really, I mean, we are in what week three or week, week two of the lockdown. So I think we are still really in the early days of finding out the bigger impact. I think we're still in this crisis mode. And I think in that crisis mode, everybody is waiting to see what their clients are doing. Um, and that's having the impact on how they're behaving. What I feel like is that those clients who are being super value add and super consultative with their customers, those agencies who are doing that at the moment are the ones who are going to do well out of this or survive this. And those agencies that are working how they can pivot their offering, whether that be you know, changing their offering or changing, you know, how they work with their clients, which obviously we're forced to do because we can't meet them. Those are the ones that are doing well. Um, and I obviously think it's, it's interesting because obviously some clients, have been, I've got a client who is a marketing agency that focuses on the event sector. So you can imagine, I've got a call with them next week, actually, so we'll find out, but you can imagine they, their clients, they've lost every single client bar one. And the one client they've kept is the um, membership organization for events, um, which was which was one of their clients. But the others, of course, have all pulled out or paused things. But, you know, the th even to them, I'd be saying, right, guys, work out how you can pivot. So are you helping your clients get online? Are you helping your clients, um, you know, launch virtual events uh, so that it doesn't look kind of like just this binary, we can run an event or we die. So I think those clients who are being really, uh, con uh, really consultative and pivoting are the ones that are going to do okay but I think it's early days so yeah. I think you know ask me that question again in a month or two and we'll probably know more yeah I, I think, think there's going to be a to add to that is um, there's a lot of agencies that are still trying to I mean you know and not not just marketing agencies but agencies and other disciplines that are still trying to push things which we all know just aren't relevant and it's, you know, especially in the current model. And it's just like they're trying to, you know, they're just trying to land grab and just trying to take money from people. And it's just, and I think. They, uh, yeah. And it's, and it's, it's interesting because a couple of clients and a few people have asked me, do I think they should continue marketing themselves? And I can't write in bigger words the answer yes with a but. And the but is that you have to do it with sensitivity and empathy you so you absolutely the, the now is the time to be marketing yourself but you have to be also listening to your audience understanding their real pains that they have now and then marketing yourself to solve those pains not just blindly marketing what you've always done yeah. because i mean it's interesting because i'm right in the middle of a launch and i can't really tell you whether this is going to be successful or not but i run a group coaching program every year and I've always, for the last six months, planned to launch it last Thursday. And it's the doors are open for a week for it. And um, I was in six months, should I launch this or shouldn't I launch it? And I'm a member of a Slack group of agency owners. So I went to that group and I asked them, do you think I should still launch this or do you think I should delay? And I got massively polarized views. So I got a whole, literally 50% of people saying you should delay it. And then 50% of people saying, no, do it because people are going to need this kind of um, online support more than ever so I've gone ahead and done it whether it's going to be a success I really don't know at the moment but um, so I you know I'm saying to people you should still market yourselves the other thing I have found just this is not very scientific it's just my own experience is that because we're all working at home and we're all getting online like this the social media world is getting really busy at the moment everybody's realizing you know I, I've, I've run webinars for example for quite a long time but now everybody's doing it um, and the tech is in place to help us do that. But what I found is that I also do um, quite a lot of email marketing and I've seen, and because I'm in this open uh, phase of registration for my program, I've been doing a lot of emails like every single day and I've seen open rates go up 
and I've seen click through rates go up. And those are the two metrics that you would always want to look at. And I think it's obviously because people have got more time to read that stuff, but also everyone's really focused on the whole social media world, but some of those more traditional marketing things like email marketing, which is never going to go away, which is still one of the most effective forms of marketing is actually getting more engagement at the moment. It might also be as simple as the fact that we're all just completely glued to our laptops and our screens now. So when we're totally. in our office in London, I'm always kind of, you know, going off to buy a coffee or having a meet face to face meeting with someone. But now, so even when I'm on, you know, these vodcasts, for example, when I mean, I've actually turned my email off now because I got told off because it kept binging with the sound through the, the vodcast. But yeah, good, good plan. Just in front of it all the time, and you 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 look at it more than you have. Yeah. So don't you think that um, we're going to, when we come out the other side of this, we, people are going to realize that they can work remotely, that people can be more productive working remotely and that we probably should be, I've got a client who um, had this conversation with me this week and they were like, I'm thinking they have a London office and they were saying, I'm thinking of closing the office after this because we're actually working more effectively at the moment. And if we can put, you know, slightly different structures, like more frequent, shorter communications with our teams in place, then actually working remotely is totally possible and also means everybody can be more productive. Yeah. No, I I completely agree with you. I mean, the irony was with us, um, we've, you know, we're already set up to work remotely because people do tend to work from home if they're busy. So if they want to get their head down, they tend to go home rather than being, you know, because when you're in the office, it's, you know, coffee, someone cracks a joke like you know, <laughs> yeah sure someone interrupts you yeah no absolutely yeah so everyone was already set up um but yeah i think moving forward i don't know it might be the opposite where nobody wants to work at home anymore because they're sick and tired of being at home <laughs> after, after, after. <laughs> well it'll probably i reckon it'll be some hybrid thing it'll be like you know we've got office space that we can use that we're all going to come to one day a week but we can actually work remotely we would perhaps be more flexible about working remotely i just think it's interesting that you know, if there are any positive outcomes to come out of this, you know, that's probably one of them. Yeah. Well, so, you could have the, the sort of hybrid office approach where, I mean, I was thinking we could actually downsize our office in London because it's obviously very, it's in Oxford Street, so it's very expensive. I mean, it's great. It's a great, um, you know, sort of selling tool for recruitment. because obviously people want to work in Soho and kind of work stuff. But actually, you probably could almost have a, you know, a hot desking thing where people have just got somewhere to come into they don't actually have their, their their actual desk is at home, but this is more a pod for them to just come in and yeah. And that. you know, when we're talking about pivoting, things like serviced offices really need to figure that one out because obviously they're really hurting at the moment. So what can they do to provide value to their clients during this period, and how do they need to amend yeah. um, themselves accordingly post coronavirus? Because you know there's no doubt that they will all lose business afterwards because people will decide that well, i actually don't need that expensive office so they need to offer more flexibility yeah in the french office uh, we're in a we work and in the uk we're in a spaces and um, which is the regis version both of them are being extremely difficult um are they really that's, that's yeah so the one in paris which is in lafayette i mean it's a beautiful um office but they basically just shut the place down there's no, so no one can even go in and they're still trying to charge full rent for, for use. And they've been locked in, locked in Paris to be on lockdown for what, five or six weeks? Yeah, it's such short-sighted kind of business yeah. practice because it's going to be a surefire way of losing clients when their contracts come up. Exactly. And then, you know, in the UK here, I mean, they're just, I mean, they're just difficult here anyway, but <laughs> for all sorts of reasons. But I think, yeah, yeah. I think we work, we're probably in trouble a bit before this all happens. So they're definitely going to be, struggling during and after this they're probably just trying to get as much money as they can it's like a lot of airlines a um, mile and a half works in travel and a lot of airlines basically if you can't fly they're not refunding your um your airfare they're letting you defer it to another flight because if they refund everybody they'll all go bust it's quite yeah. simple as that so they're saying you can fly within two years of your ticket and da da da. i think every airline's doing that so maybe that's what they let you move your flight to when you can use it i mean it'd be very hard for them just to refund everyone's flights throughout the rest of the year and pay salaries and all that kind of stuff so yeah so at the moment um 
what sort of, I mean, if you've got sort of two or three bits of advice that you could give an agency right now to try and navigate this situation, what do you think the sort of two or three key things they should be thinking about? I think the first thing they have to do is go and talk to all their clients. Anyone that's burying their head in the sand, hoping that the client will just carry on working on the retainer or the project they've been on without actually addressing it head on is probably silly. And that's not a good approach. So the first thing I would say is go and talk to your clients and listen to them. We need to be really good listeners at the moment. The second thing I would say is that more than ever, we need to be very consultative. So we need to be, because our clients are looking at us to help advise them on how to navigate this. Not that we are any more expert than them particularly, but we have an external view. Um, So I think, you know, we need to listen. We need to be consultative. We need to help. We need to help our clients pivot and we need to pivot if necessary and um we need to offer true value so like you said earlier if people are just blindly trying to flog the same things that they did before when people don't want to you know i've written before um i wrote a blog years ago that said are you selling painkillers or vitamin pills to your clients and it was a blog that did really well and i sort of re-updated it a bit for coronavirus because it seems more apt than ever so a bit you know if your client's got a headache are you selling them a vitamin pill that you know will be really good for them and it probably stop them having a headache in the future? Or are you selling them a painkiller that will get rid of their pain right now and get rid of their headache? Because I'll tell you what, right now our clients want painkillers. They don't want vitamin pills. And I think too many agencies are selling vitamin pills. So I think at the moment you need to listen to your clients and make sure what you're selling is actually curing one of their, if you can support to cure one of their top three pains, then you should be. That's certainly what I'm trying to do. Um, and the other, this is my fourth point. So I've got four for the price of three. The fourth thing I think is don't discount your services, but offer more or offer different services. So I'll give you a quick story. Hopefully they won't watch this, but I have a current client who uh, is a PR company and they just won a new client just before coronavirus kicked off. And obviously they were worried that the new client wouldn't start or would end after one month. So they went to that client and said, I'll tell you what, we will do the first six months work at a third of the retainer fee. And we'll put in writing that at the end of six months, you will go back up to the full retainer fee. And I said, I think that's a really bad idea because the client will get very used to getting a certain level of service for a certain fee. And at the six month point, they won't want to pay two thirds more for the same level of service. They'll either expect you to do two thirds more service or they'll just say no. So I, um, so I said, look, you're better off renegotiating the whole thing and offering something different during this uncertain period so that you stay connected with them. And then you go back, you know, you renegotiate the contract at the six month period. So I don't think people should be discounting at the moment. I think if you're going to do anything more, add more value and think about how you can serve your clients differently. Yeah. No, well, I'm obviously a chip off the old block then. So I've got three examples of those things we're doing at the moment, which I'll share good for you. Yeah, so go for it. When you say listen, our P&L documents have all got, the first thing we did was put them all into a, um, a, a traffic light system. So red, amber and green. And after conversations with the clients and their kind of regular calls, you know, we just put in a, well, should we worry about this client, this client, but we've already had the budget conversations and everything staying as it is. Or, you know, are these guys not able to sell? So they're suddenly an amber because they're at risk. So it just gives you like the visibility of, right, what, you know, where is the business right now? What could happen? Worst case scenario in terms of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the consult thing, we set up a division. Well, we basically set up um, an opportunity for clients to have it, um, you know, a one-to-one with someone in the agency to just basically talk through all their current marketing activities for the rest of the year. So anything that's face-to-face, how do we, you know, approach that and what's the best approach for them? Um, The discount thing as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, one client in particular, they've basically not been able to pay. They've not been able to sell anything since the coronavirus because they're, they're, you know, their online commerce thing just dried up because of Amazon reprioritizing. And what we did was we, they wanted to kind of pause for three months, but we ended up just kind of saying, look, we'll keep your team in place. We'll be reactive. So anyone, any journalist or, you know, influencer that comes in and, um, you know, has a request, we'll manage that request for you until this time is over with, because they've been a client for, you know, a number of years. So we're supporting them through the time, but then as soon as it kind of 
goes back to normal, you know, the service will resume at fee again and not. So at the moment, we're just kind of, you know, holding fault for them. So I think that is a re- that's another thing I would say is that if you do have clients that are totally pausing work with you, you need to find a way of still adding value to those people without obviously providing your paid for service so that when things get better, they haven't forgotten you. And I know that sounds silly, but I always say to clients, look, when you're engaging with your prospects, it's like refilling a sand timer. And if you don't re-engage with that prospect before the sand timer runs out, they forget about you because, you know, and then you bump into them one day and they say, oh, we just hired a PR agency. We should have thought of you, but we didn't. Um, so, you know, it's the same with clients. So we have got clients, like I've got a couple of clients that are pausing things with me. And it's like, okay, so one of the things I'm doing at the moment is I'm shooting a weekly sort of down and dirty video of like, these are Rob's thoughts for the week. And this is, you know, some stuff that I'm seeing and hearing, and this is what I think you should be doing. And I'm just sending this sort of down and dirty video to my clients every week, regardless of what what they're doing with me at the moment, because I just want to keep adding value. But what I don't want to do is offer my service for free. Yeah. Well, no, I learned that from you actually. That's, you know, I'd rather reduce the fee and the service, but keep in touch with the client. Nobody to re-engage properly. You know, having on, you know, it's better to send an invoice for one pound and carry on talk to, talking to them and doing very little amount of work than having to re-win the work three months, six months later. Um, yeah. It's like you say, it's a completely new discussion. You know, you're suddenly in the pitch in a pitch process then trying to win the yeah. work back. So, and it's hard. I think when you're with the incumbent agency in that situation, it's probably quite hard to win because they know what your track record is. They don't know whether the promises that all the other agencies are making are true or just a load of ball really but there's different reasons i mean if a company has generally got you know an issue with something and you know i'd rather they you know reduce the fee than got behind with payments and i think you know are you know i've been you know like yourself and doing this a long time and the companies that you know suddenly start to slip with payment and still tell you everything's all right you know (laughs) yeah your alarm bell should be raised but you know the ones you respect are the ones that say look you know we're going to have to reduce because we've got a tight cash flow situation at the moment. But as soon as that's over, it goes back up and they do do that and they respect their word. You know, you want to work with them more at the end of it because they're honest with you. And you know, that's all you are. Yeah. And you know what, if you have a, I know this is a bit of a cliche, but if you have a partner, partner relationship with your clients, you're much more likely to hear that. If you have this unequal supplier customer type relationship, then that's when they start, you know, you're at the bottom of the food chain there and that's when they, either cut things without even communicating with you or they're not honest with you. Yeah. Cool. So, um, I mean, I'm obviously a firm believer in having a mentor or a coach, you know, I was obviously schooled by, you know, one of the best Rob, um, someone (laughs) who's obviously you need someone who can question you and ask you the right questions about yourself. I mean, if you're a mentor to a business, ask the question, the right questions about the business, but you know, why do you think that, you know, mentors or coaches are important, you know, especially at the moment? Well, I think we should all have a, a mentor or a coach in our life somewhere. I mean, I, I'm still part, I'm old now and grey, and I still I'm still part of a coaching program, an American coaching program. So I have a coach that works with me with some of the things I do. I feel like um, for agency owners, particularly, it doesn't matter whether you are a one man band or you're running a big agency, it's still lonely at the top and you still uh, don't always have that um, peer group that you can bounce ideas off and that help you make decisions with clarity and confidence and perspective and objectivity. So I think we need that more than ever at the moment. I think now we're working at home, it's definitely lonely. So having someone who can, um, you know, give you advice, can be a coach, consultant, shoulder to cry on, advisor, all the, and everything in between, because I think that's what we should be, um, then I think that's really important. I also think that for agency owners, having someone that you're accountable with is really important. Like I see a lot of my clients either fortnightly or monthly, and they'll always go, oh, I'm seeing Rob next week. I better make sure I've done the things that I agreed with him I would do because they know I'm going to give them some tough love if they don't do that because it's no skin off my nose, but obviously they won't move their agencies forward. So I think that accountability, if you ask my clients would, would definitely be one of the um, reasons why they, they hire a coach. And I think just that confidence that, that I'm making the right decisions. And at the moment I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm not a guru or a um, crystal ball gazer. So I don't know any more than anybody else about 
where we're at or what the future is but I, there are certain things that we've already talked about that i know people should be doing and if they don't have someone to talk to about that stuff then you know they might be making bad decisions right now so yeah. you know they've got to keep moving forward I, i've been running a series of webinars this week and i had to rewrite the webinar quite quickly because of coronavirus and part of the webinar is talking about vision and I'm saying to people, look, guys, you know, I know you, you're all going to be very focused on short term plans, but you still need to have half, half an eye on the vision for your agency. Otherwise, when you come out of this, you're going to flounder and you will get left behind because there will be those agencies that have a vision. So it's just kind of having someone that can help you do that, that can kind of metaphorically grab you by the scruff of the neck and hold you up high so that you can get a perspective and see the wood for the trees, I think is really important. Yeah, no, that's another thing I learned from you as well, actually, just about looking at the bigger picture. I mean, it's very easy for agency owners to focus on things that are in the moment. So, you know, it's like <laughs> you lose a client, you know, at that particular time, you haven't got much cash in the bank because you're in that kind of cycle of, you know, you just paid all your bills, but the other your payments haven't come in. And you can be very focused on just the negative stuff that's going on right there and right now. But actually, when you talk, sort of take a step back and look at your cash flow over a year and then all the prospects you've got in place and actually, you know, now is the right time to be hiring that right person for this, you know, for this sort of next growth phase. You know, that's the kind of thing to do. And it's very, like I say, it's very easy to get caught up in the moment and just worry about, you know, I think you called it catastrophic planning when you were asleep yeah. at night. Probably, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. that catastrophic thinking. But, you know, the thing is, it's... Um, it is a, it's a naff cliche, but it is so true. It's like we spend too much time working in our businesses and not enough time working on our businesses and coaching helps you. It makes you put the pause button on and makes you work on your business for a period of time. <clears throat> I think more than ever at the moment, we have actually got time to work on our businesses. It's just that people aren't always sure about what they should be doing. My experience is that if you were to do some analysis about why agency owners or business owners in general don't spend enough time working on their business it's because they don't know what to do so if if you there's so many things they could do they don't know how to what to what to prioritize and that's where coaching mentoring non-exec director all that stuff that's where it all comes in yeah no well i definitely believe it so um bit of a fun question here so if we had to wind back the clock to you know i'm an account exec working for you again and you know we're the Stowcastle business park by the way i went past the other day and our old office is now a nail bar is it oh my god good uh, times yeah um so if we had to work from home and we were 20 years ago you know do you think we could do it because bear in mind we had i think when i started it was a mac power pc which took i don't know i had time to make a coffee uh, go, go and walk your dog by the time it booted up in the morning. Do you know what? It's, it's, um, I, I do some training with um, agencies and I say, I've got one particular client I do some training with and they're all sort of um, millennials. And I say to them, you know, do you realise that we used to stop and print a um, hundred press releases off and stuff them in an envelope and put them through the franking machine. And then someone said, Hey Rob, what's a franking machine? And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm old. Um, well, I, there, you, we, you only got a franking machine after I'd worn my tongue out on stamps. <laughs> you certainly couldn't, you certainly couldn't be licking stamps now, could you? So um, I, I think the answer is probably it would be really difficult because I'm not even sure whether the technology existed for us to pick up an, a phone and do a conference call like with a group of us. So I'm not even sure whether we could have done that. Um, I think times were much simpler. I think we would have to have really different systems in place to cope with this because we couldn't do video conferencing like this. I mean, if you want to have a team meeting with your team today, it would be pretty easy to say, right, guys, we'll get on Zoom at this time. I'm going to have a team meeting. You know, back then we couldn't do that. Um, so I think it would have been really difficult. I think we would have been on the phone um, a lot, but it would have been really difficult. Yeah, I said there was no, when I first started, I remember you had a CompuServe email, but no one, you never got any emails because you're the only one that had one. I know. And no, you, no. you had your dial up modem to log on. That, yeah. You know, it's funny, isn't it? It wasn't very long ago, but it's funny how the world's changed. You know, we had a fax machine. Yeah, told off as well for not changing the, um, 
I think it was a, a D2 RAID drive or something that backed everything up with one of our clients actually retrospect uh, dance at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I always used to forget to change the hard drive, <laughs> the tape drive or whatever it was. And um, amazing. Yeah, it I, I think it would be really difficult because I think the other thing is if we had been told quite quickly, like we have, to, you can't go to your office, then we would just have not had access to files. Whereas now everything's online. Back then it wasn't. So I think unless we could literally have gone to the office and grabbed everything and brought it home, it would have been really difficult. But there weren't even really, even lap, were there even laptops though? I think there were laptops, but we didn't use them, did we? No. So I, I think, I think, actually the more we talk this through, I think it would have been, if this had happened 20 years ago, it would have been pretty much a disaster for everybody. I think yeah. the government would have had to handle it differently because they couldn't just say, right, you can't go to your office. Yeah. I mean, the only thing is that I think things moved a lot slower back then. I mean, I remember, um, you know, now when we've got kind of, um, I don't know, a client does a news piece or announces something, they are literally, you know, 10 minutes later asking us where the coverage is, you know, has it, or has it appeared on this site yet? You know, but back then, you know, you should be able to send the press release out and then take a holiday for six weeks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, the world was, on the positive side, the world was much simpler and more straightforward and there were way less channels to reach your target audience than there are now. And that's, yeah. you know, so it was it's pros and cons. But I think in terms of working remotely, we would have struggled. Yeah, definitely. I mean, no one, no one would have asked in those days, can I work at home today? not because we would have been mean and said no, but because it just wasn't on anyone's radar because it wasn't possible. Yeah. Well, you just wouldn't have. I mean, even I think probably even up to a couple of years ago, it was still, I don't know, there was still kind of when you, when someone works at home, I don't know that it's still not a hundred percent kind of resistant free. I mean, you, you would almost kind of question, well, if this person was asking to work at home, that'd be absolutely fine because you know that person's going to get on with work and they're very in touch with you. This person, you would, because maybe they work a different way and they're not so kind of in touch, you kind of worry about, you know, well, are they going to be working, you know, and it's not, and that's not because they wouldn't be working, but you just sort of still have yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we still have to earn the trust to have the yeah. right to do that. But I th suppose in a way, with what's going on at the moment, the idea of nine to five has gone out the window a bit. I mean, I'm, I've been working longer than ever, not, I don't really know why, but because I've been getting out of bed and, you know, I mean, I, well, I always work at home anyway, but I've been getting out of bed and I'm at desk by seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And the last few weekends I've been working as well because there's not much to do. Yeah. Um, and I've had stuff I could do. So, and I love what I do. So it's, you know, it's not difficult, but yeah, I don't think we could have, I think we would have struggled 20 years ago I think it's bad enough now but go back 20 years and we would have struggled maybe we'd have had some different solutions but I don't know really well this is this situation is exactly the reason why Ranieri agency ended up becoming Ranieri agency because I let's like say when I left um, CIT I went to just do freelance work but they ended up working at home and after two years of working at home I realized I was just becoming detached from the rest of the world I was getting up late I was kind of not getting dressed and you realized that people were coming home from their working day, my neighbors, and I was still in like my, you know, my <laughs> sleep room here. I won't say my, you know, my, it was just like, I wasn't, your, wasn't your, because, um, your Superman PJs. Yeah. My, you know, my credible Hulk pajamas. <laughs> um, but it wasn't because I wasn't working, but my clients mm. were, even back then were becoming sort of U S based. So they were coming online later. And so, you know, my work would then be, started to creep into the evening and then you suddenly realize you know you don't you start to have you don't have that sort of separation between work and home so yeah. your laptop's there every time you hear it ping an email's come in and whether you were you know downstairs watching tv you suddenly feel the urge to go up and answer it which is i think it's um i think it's a whole different topic but if you do work at home, you have to get certain boundaries in place. Yeah. I have a thing that I love that I always tell people to do use, which I have a morning ritual and an evening ritual. And it's my way of, so I start my day exactly the same. And I end my day when I'm working at home, exactly the same. And that is my leaving work thing. And one of the things I'll often do is because I do get dressed for work. 
So I'll often, when I finish work in my office and I go up to the bedroom, I'll change because that's a kind of a mental way of getting out of work. So a whole different topic, but if you are working at home, you have to have good boundaries. You have to be really clear when you're at work and when you're not at work. And if you're fortunate enough like me to have an office, then you can literally shut the door um, and finish work. But we all got to get used to it because it's the world we live in and it could be the world like this for the next God knows how long. So yeah, well, I think that, to a certain extent, hopefully it won't be locked down like a hundred percent like this for too long, but um, there's definitely going to be some refer the restrictions, I think, which we've all just got to get used to. So, yeah. So, um, exactly. Do you think uh, having spanned, I guess, the, the pre-digital and the fully digital sort of eras now, and that doesn't mean you're old, Rob, that just it's happened in that, short space of time um do you think that, yeah. 30 years nearly 28 years yeah, you've got you know a few years on me <laughs> <laughs> um, i've certainly got gray hairs on you yeah. i mean i remember when i started um with you i mean pr agencies back then i guess compared to that as to, compared to what they are now are much, it was a much more straightforward business you know? yeah you think think about it back then there were fundamentally in the tech space, there were two channels to market. There were the print, there was the print media and there was the analyst community. And that was it. There was no social media, no, well, you know, no LinkedIn, none of that stuff. So it was very straightforward. Like you said, it was much slower. You sent stuff in the post. Um, and it, to some extent, the, the, the relationships with the media stand today. You know, you, you still wouldn't, the things that we would say, don't do I'd still say don't do like you know you don't send a press release and then follow up with a journalist to find out whether they received the press release I think we would have said that back in our CIT days and you know I'd say that today so I think the world was much simpler um, and I think that enabled you to build really good relationships with some people I think today the world is much noisier and like you say much faster the channels to market are really different now we've got social media we've got you know, a whole raft of sort of bloggers and vlogger journalists that some of us want to engage with. We've got the influencers that we want to engage with, the analysts, the print media, the online media. So it's a much crazier world, much more fast moving. Um, but also that presents more opportunities for you to get your clients in front of the different audiences. So I think it's a more sophisticated today. It's faster moving, but fundamentally when you strip it away, the same I'm sure you say some of the exactly the same things to your team that we would have said back in the 90s. So fundamentally, it's not that different, but it, it is different, you know, like say slower pace of life. It took us a lot longer to do things than it does now. Yeah. And that's both good and bad, really. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. The only thing I just do try and get across to the people that work around the area, I think that um, some of that skill that we had in the old days, which was that sort of, you know, the personal skills, the one-to-one -one skills that you had to build, you know, that was absolutely the number one essential thing you had to do. So, you know, if you wanted to get coverage for your client, you know, you had to have a good relationship with all the journalists and that meant investing the time in getting to <coughs> them, going to see them, having a few drinks with them, you know, really building those relationships. And I Definitely. Think because the comms industry has got so busy with activity. So like you say, you could do, you know, media, social content, you know, influencer communications, everything is potentially a lot more sort of transactional based now, especially with influencers. Yeah. You know, people have kind of started to, I think, lose that skill. Um, Cause they do- I also think without sounding, without insulting any of your audience, I don't know. <laughs> I feel like part of the issue is the millennial uh, generation. I feel like I have this conversation a lot with clients where they have people in their twenties um, who were want to hide behind email because that's how they're used to communicating through an electronic medium of Instagram or Facebook or whatever the latest thing is an email. And, you know, us older fuddy duddies want people to go and talk to people, even if that's picking up the phone, people still seem more resistant about that now. But I think there's three things that are really still true. You've got to be good at building relationships. You've got to understand how to tell a story and you've got to be a good writer. Yeah. And those three things st stood well. They were so true back in the nineties and they're still true today, aren't they? hundred percent. I mean, I think, you know, the millennials are much more set up to be able to cope with 
the way the world works these days because they've been brought up in that world. Um, they're used to kind of multitasking across all these different platforms. But I actually think they, they could stand out, you know, from the rest of the crowd. Sorry, my phone. Oh, you haven't turned something off. <laughs> <laughs> hello <laughs> hello that's good they uh, the Chinese take away. are actually on there so i can't delete it i think someone's got yeah but they you know they're much more the millennials are much more set up to kind of deal with this kind of multitasking commerce program yeah so i actually think the ones that could stand out if they learn that old school kind of you know face-to-face -face relationship building being able to sell a story to someone that they know and they you know, I think they would become, a, you know, they would basically stand out from the crowd, you know, because there are, you know, a plethora of, you know, millennial comms people that all do a very similar job. And they kind of, in, I, I, I'd hate to say they're interchangeable, but you, you, they could almost yeah, be. Yeah, exactly. I think the other skill that I see a lot of account managers, senior account managers, account directors even lacking is the ability to upsell. You know, they don't necessarily see selling um, new business to existing clients necessarily as part of their role. And of course, it should be once you get a bit more senior in an agency, they should have a business development um, aspect to their role. Well, they don't have to, but a lot of agencies want people to when they're like a senior account director, account, uh, account director or whatever. And they struggle to do that. And often I hear the excuse was, I'm just too busy delivering the client work. So... I mean, I'm not trying to diss everybody. I'm just trying to make that comparison between the, the old way, days the and the new at, days. The way I look at that within my own agency is I just think that comes, you know, I think the responsibility can also be put at the, the line manager or the mentor's door. Because, you know, if, they, if upselling doesn't come naturally, I mean, I remember, you know, obviously, you know, you had a partner back then, Andrew, and um, one thing I learned from him, I think, was more probably like the face-to-face -face sales side because... You know, he was a great, great salesman. You know, you can't argue with that. And, no, he was, yeah. He you know, still but, is. Yeah, and, you know, I'm, you know, my probably skill within the agency, even to this day, is I'm probably the, the guy that, you know, networks and does the sort of, opens the doors. And that, well, I can trace all that back, you know, to that that sort of mentoring. So, yeah, people, you know, they're not upselling on accounts. You know, you, you do have to ask questions. Have they been mentored correctly? I completely agree with you. And it's really interesting that a lot of agency owners think as someone moves up through the ranks, they will naturally have those skills or management skills. And of course, that is not true at all. We absolutely, why would, why would we, if we wanted someone to be able to, I don't know, program with, uh, you know, use Photoshop, we would teach them how to use Photoshop. But we don't do the same thing with some kind of skills like management skills or sales skills. And yet we should be investing in that with people and not just assuming that as they move up for the ranks, they naturally have those skills because they don't. Just because you did or I did doesn't mean they will. So. I see people have natural aptitudes for things and they do tend to, you know, do those things more. Yeah, naturally. gravitate to them. Yeah, of course. But, you know, like say, if people want to move up the scale and they want to become, you know, an account director, a senior account director, maybe even MD one day you know, they have to realise, they have to be able to, you know, they have to do all these things. And yeah. they all have to be able to mentor people to do these things because, again, the more higher up you go, the less you actually do, the more you mentor and the more you totally. kind of manage. So, Absolutely, yeah. 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 You should be enabling everyone else to be fantastic at their job. Yeah, so, so look, Rob, we could, uh, I'm sure we could talk all day. Um, I know you're a busy man. You've got, you've got a new service to launch. Um, <laughs> yeah too but uh yeah look, i just want to thank you for your um time today it's been really you know really interesting to talk to you again um and i my pleasure you invite me back onto your podcast I'll be definitely the agency accelerator you will be i'll be dropping you an email today to get you scheduled in yeah you can use me as the case study for all the things that you shouldn't do <laughs> <laughs> no i think people will be really interested to hear your journey that's the like you've been asking me mine i think people you know, my podcast aimed at agency owners and um, I think people, are, you're a really great example of a great success story with a number of twists and turns along the way. And um, so I think that's what people are interested in. You know, we can, none of us, you, me, anybody can get where they have got to without making loads of errors and mistakes along the way. And it's those things that enable us to move to the next level, really.
Yeah, I think, um, you know, you're 100% right. I think there's a lot of things that people don't do a lot of things because they fear failure. And, um, you know, but that in itself is the reason why you'll never succeed. So, totally. Know, yep. I completely agree. Sometimes. You also have to, you know, I think, I think it may have even been you again that taught me this, but, you know, you have to listen to people's advice. But at the end of the day, you've got to decide to do it yourself, whether you agree with their advice or not. You know, you should be informed, but you should also stick to your guns. I mean, when I wanted to leave CIT, um, you know, I remember my mum, you know, asked me, you know, could I afford the petrol if I left the, you know, um, CIT? And I was like, what? It was, but she was kind of, I think you, you, when you take advice from people to do something, you need to take advice from people who've done it. And but, you know what, that, that's so important. So if you are ever choosing a coach or a mentor, you have to find someone that you are on a similar wavelength with that you trust implicitly, that you know they've got your back, but they will be tough with you if they need to because they've got your best intentions at heart. I think it's worth saying, like you were with us for nine years. Imagine most agencies now having staff for nine years. It's just, you know, it yeah. doesn't. It doesn't exist. In fact, you and Lloyd, who was our employee number two, yeah. have both go, gone on to run your own agencies. And well, quite a few people, because Haley runs her own agency. If you remember yeah. her and Emmeline and all those guys. So that's, you know, it's fantastic. Yes, I do think in the early days, I know we're going to finish in a second, because I know we could talk all day, but I do think that if, you, if you've learned, you know, your first, like my first job with you was when you are in a sort of almost startup position. And I think that's just, the way we were used to working. So we just kind of, it doesn't scare us because we've not walked into an office that had 200 people and, you know, you have to work your way up the ladder to get success. You know, we learned with you and Andrew that you had to go out and take it. You have to go and earn it. And I think that's the difference. I mean, I think if you're, I was lucky enough to join you when you were in that phase. So that's how, that's the way I think. That's the way I was meant yeah. to. So. I think uh, naive, innocent youth was on our side in those days like we just didn't know what we didn't know so we just went on and did it and yeah. you know sometimes people say god that was really brave and I was like well it didn't feel brave at the time it just felt like that's what you did so um you know and the older you get the more you learn and perhaps that stops you getting out of your comfort zone but we've got to keep stepping outside our comfort zone if we want to keep growing and learning yeah definitely Even so you're old and crying yeah I think um you know well you still at the same work so you know don't <laughs> Thanks. I got the I got the fade the faded look on the camera. <laughs> Hyper wrinkles. Yeah. I want to again thank you for your time. Um, yeah, let's stay in touch and um, yeah, I'll um, let me know when you want me to get on your podcast. I certainly will do. Yeah, great speaking to you again. Cheers.